We have far more to fear from within than from without. While current events in the secular realm point to the mark of the beast crisis and the second coming of Jesus, in addition, we're seeing signs within the SDA community that point to the nearness of the mark of the beast, the pouring out of the seven last plagues. Signs are ominous. It's a life and death matter. As a result, these things must be addressed. Greetings, salutations, and welcome to this midday power surge, Safe to Serve International and first time viewers. This is your spiritual oasis on this pilgrim journey. I'm your host, Andrew Henriquez. Before I get into this, there is an upcoming career expo that is connected with our online, of course, our virtual school. It's within a few days from now. That flyer and the video is below this video. And don't forget, we launched the YouTube platform for our school, Three Angels Academy. Please share, subscribe, hit that bell for upcoming events. We are preparing an army of youth rightly trained to be used by God in these last days. All right. So why are we here today? What's trending? Not, nothing going on in the world today, more so in the church. The SDA conference and SDA union have now ordained another woman. But this particular woman advocates for LGBT, promotes sodomy, exhorts Gomorrah. We have to address this. And there's always a setting. In 2015, the General Conference, North American Division, the Biblical Research Institute, Andrews University, Lake Union Conference, and a whole host of other entities within the SDA community published this particular document. And as a result, ever since we have begun to see sodomy broadcasted, prevalent within the SDA community, let's see what happened this past Sabbath on March 16th. Listen. It is not with pleasure that I report that on March 16, 2024, the Potomac Conference President, Charles Tapp, along with other conference officers, with the complicity of the Columbia Union, ordained to the Gospel Ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church female LGBT ally and advocate, Joanne Cortez. Hmm. So, of course, I went doing my research and I came across their Facebook page. There it is, Potomac Conference of Seventh-day Adventists. And later on, I'm going to be addressing Charles Tapp, the one on the left of the screen. I will address him shortly. I know him personally from the days at Oakwood College. I'll get to that. But there you have it, my friends, on the right of your screen. That is Joanne Cortez, the church beloved church in Washington, D.C., this past Sabbath, it writes, it states, we honor her answer to the call to pastor and to plant churches for the worldwide Seventh-day Adventist church. Congratulations, Pastor Cortez. We know God will bless you and your family's ministry, Columbia Union visitor, and that is her plaque. Several pictures that I took from their Facebook page. It's right there, friends. And uh, Joanne Cortez is actually the wife of Jose Cortez Jr. Who is he? He is uh, Associate Director for Evangelism, Ministerial Association at the North American Division of SDA. I wonder who is actually the leader in that home. For the Bible tells us that an elder must be husband of one wife. Elder in the Bible is linked to priest, elder, priest, minister, pastor in the field, husband of one wife. And the Bible says that one male husband who is converted, if he cannot 
rule his own house. Neither can he care for the church. So who is ruling in that home? Because now the wife is the pastor. This is destroying God's order in the home. Bringing a, a bewilderedness, bringing what I call discombobulation in the church. What do we call that? He says confusion in the church. There it is, friends. Pictures. That's it. Or jubilation. Promoting apostasy. We have 3 a.m. in the chat rights. Here in Phoenix, all but one church, all but one church has a woman elder. This is uh, Elder Larry, again, reporting on what happened this past Sabbath. This is the actual woman who promotes LGBT, advocates for LGBT. Here it is. With the complicity of the Columbia Union, it's ordained to the gospel ministry of the Seventh-day Adventist Church female LGBT ally and advocate, Joanne Cortez. And on that same video, Elder Larry actually played several clips from Joanne Cortez. I'll put a link to that video below in the description. You can watch everything. I'll simply give you a few clips. So we all have biases. You know, you can also see these biases when you show favoritism, when you have a tendency to show favoritism to a certain group of people over another. And perhaps it could be because of the color of their skin, or maybe the idea that certain roles apply to a specific gender. How many times have we rejected people because of tattoos, jewelry, they were wearing jeans instead of a suit, perhaps too much makeup. They were gay, transgender, and we never really tried to get to know them or connect with them. Do you because see we thought that upholding standards of perfection were more vital and supreme than making room for an individual that did not meet our expectations. You're shaking your head, <laughs> Brother Preacher. Different. What are your thoughts? Perfection is not important? Hmm? What are your thoughts? Standards of God's word, elevating apostasy above God's standards. Do you know what we see is about to transpire? Once these individuals become leaders in the church, you'll see a transition. Watch carefully, listen attentively. From LGBT advocate to LGBT leaders in the church. Clip two. Now, don't get me wrong, all right? There are some traditions that are good, but if there is a tradition that excludes or makes someone feel out of place and not welcomed, guys, that tradition has to be set aside because people are more important. What tradition? You mean Bible truth? Because we would rather remain comfortable with like-minded people than open our doors to allow people from all walks of life to commune with us. That's just too uncomfortable. And as a result, we have become irrelevant, stuck within the four walls of our churches, unable to connect effectively with people who are different. Because it makes us uncomfortable to sit next to someone whose sexuality is different to mine. It makes us uncomfortable to sit next to someone whose gender identity I don't understand, whose story requires me to truly listen and empathize with, and doing this could change my point of view so do you know what's startling be do you know what's startling the bible speaks of you know as a church the bible speaks of a woman in the bible that we would call licentious her name was mary and mary came to christ christ empathized with mary did he not but let christ leave mary as she was in sin come as you are but don't remain as you are these so-called advocates, including Joanne Cortez, what they're actually saying is, come as you are and remain as you are. In Mark chapter 16, the Bible tells us about Mary, out of whom went seven devils. Seven devils. 
Christ gave her victory. And think about this. Why seven? Because seven represents completion. She was totally consumed with evil and Christ gave her victory. What about the woman at the well? Adultery, sodomy, sin is sin. Why there are degrees of sin. We are told in the book, Great Controversy. Yes. Page 384. What was the origin of the great apostasy? And how did the church depart from the simplicity of the gospel? We are told, my friends, that by partaking and lowering the standards of truth in order to bring in individuals who were apostates. I want to give that to you very succinctly here. It says, my friends, they lowered the standards to secure converts. And what happened in the church? A pagan flood flowing into the church brought in customs, practices, and idols. This was the origin of the great apostasy. Second paragraph has not the same process. Been repeated in nearly every church calling itself Protestant. Think about it, my friends. We're seeing a new modeling of God's cause. And that's why we're told in the book Education, page 57, the greatest want of the world is the want of men. Men who will not be bought or sold. Men who do not fear to cause sin by its right name. Men who will stand for the right though the heavens fall. All right. Yes, friends. Yes. As we can see in volume three, page 280, it says, If God abhors one sin above another, of which his people are guilty, is doing nothing in the case of an emergency. Listen, friends. It says, Neutrality, indifferent in a religious crisis, is regarded by God as a grievous crime and is equal to the worst type of hostility against God. Why are we silent? <laughs> Larry, continue. In denomination after denomination, we've seen that theologically, women's ordination and LGBTQ advocacy go together. Uh, listen to the following excerpts drawn from just one, just one 33 minute presentation by Cortez a couple of years ago. Is this person an ally and advocate for LGBTQ? What do you think? Oh, God created each one of us with a desire to connect in order to build relationships so we can discover God, who God is through each other. You know, and each one of us, which is beautiful, is created in God's image, amen? And through each person, we get to see a glimpse of who God is. Regardless of our background, ethnicity, socioeconomic status, our gender, language, religion, beliefs, sexual orientation, geography, culture, and education, through each one, we get to see a glimpse of who God is. Oh, subtle and dangerous regardless of your sexual orientation, we can see through these people the image of God. What? So how do you interpret chapter 1 of Genesis? Verse 26 and verse 27, God made man his own image. Is God like Sodom and sodomy? How do you think God feels? We have uh, Elaine in the chat writes, it's creeping compromise. Friends, we're now seeing that women's ordination and the promotion of LGBT in the church, both are joined at the hip. Do you recall what happened to the Methodist church? Look at your screen. Why does the UMC, United Methodist Church, ordain women? And since they began to ordain women, what was the next step? Promoting LGBT. Q plus in the churches. And as a result, now we're seeing that denomination has split. Read the headlines. I don't have time for all of this. Look at that, friends. All over the country, North Carolina, Iowa, Texas, 
split in that denomination in Florida, all over Pennsylvania, split in the church over a, over 1,000, not 100, 1,800 churches split from the Methodist denomination. 2,400 plus churches disaffiliate from the Methodist church. That's why we're told in the book, Manuscript Releases, volume 11, page 229, it clearly says, watch carefully, my friend. A reformation must go through our churches. Reforms must be made. Why? Spiritual weakness and blindness are upon our people. We hoped that there would not be the necessity for another coming out. We will endeavor to keep the unity of the spirit in the bonds of peace. We will not with pen or voice cease to protest against bigotry, against apostasy. Why is that quotation relevant? Look what's happening, not only in the Methodist denomination, what's happening among the Seventh-day Adventist denomination. Have you forgotten this? Quickly, a transgender elder, LGBT Pride Month at the SDA church, the church of the pink pews, and nothing has changed since I did the reporting. Nothing has changed. LGBT choir members, nothing has changed. Gay men's chorus. Yeah. LGBT clubs on the campuses of SDA universities. Nothing has changed. And more recently, hmm? a pastor baptizing, marrying two gay men in the church and brought them in as members. What has changed? Nothing. Business as usual. Pardon me. <clears throat> There it is, friends. How do you think God feels? And this is Charles Tapp from the Potomac Conference who actually laid hands and ordained German Cortez. What does he promote? Just love. Bring them in. LGBT and all. Bring them in. Listen. Hello, family. I want to take this opportunity to clarify some things you may have read on social media recently. As a Seventh-day Adventist Christian organization, we here at the Potomac Conference believe that Scripture is both our foundation and our guide. You see, he did this video, I'll post the link below, because of the protest that has not ceased since. Hear what he goes on to say about LGBT folks in the SDA church. With this in mind, we must be clear-minded in the reality of the flock that Christ has given us to shepherd. Mm -hmm. Who comprised the flock? Hmm. And who did he bring in? Those who are bisexuals. If you're a bisexual, you are a lesbian. If you're bisexual, you are homosexual. Yeah. Washington Adventist University, the same conference with the woman's ordination. Same thing, friends. Yeah, homosexual, lesbian. That's Charles Tap for you. So sad. And we have Kaz in the chat writes, women have found so hard, women have fought, pardon me, so hard to have a recognizable position in this world that even the quote-unquote church tricked them into quote-unquote fitting in by offering them elder's position. This is false teachings. Thank you, Kaz. Yvette writes, it is such a danger that even non-SDA pastors are also talking about this same issue. They're protesting against it. So what example are we setting for the world? We have become backwards, the tail and not the head. 
and the tail represents false teachers. Isaiah chapter 9 and verse 15. Prophets of lies. Pastors who are liars, deceivers. Elder, continue. Indeed, any ordained minister employed by the North American Division present and laying hands on Sister Cortes at this service has violated their trust as an ordained minister. Mercy. Is there a role for women in the church? Surely. There are several women around Christ's ministry. Which one did Christ ordain as an elder? A past, which one? Not one. They have violated their calling, says elder. And I agree, based on the Bible, this is spirit of prophecy. Volume 5 and page 14. When teachers or professors sacrifice God's principles to please a worldly amusement loving class, they should be considered unfaithful to their trust and should be fired, terminated, discharged. Look at the screen here. So what would God say to such an abomination in the church? You see, we can blast and protest against the tyrants in the secular realm. But what about the apostates within? And many of us claim to be protesters within the SDA movement. Maybe conference lines and also independent lines of the SDA organization. And yet, when we meet the apostates, we smile in their faces. Did John the Baptist smile in the face of Herod? Hmm? Did Elijah smile and gave an embrace to Ahab in his apostasy? Hmm? That's what they do. They may say a few things online, but when they go and see these men, they give them a warm embrace, Sabbath blessings. They even bid them God's speed. The Bible says, don't beat them God's speed. If you do, you're partakers of their sins. Do you think Nathan smiled with David? That's 2 John chapter 1. 2 John chapter 1. That's it, right? Do not bid them God's speed. 2 John chapter 1, verse, verse 7 through verse 11. Don't bid them God's speed. If you do, you become partakers of their evil deeds. Nathan was sent to David. Thou art the man. An apostate right now. Did Nathan go to appease and smile and laugh and have fellowship and dinner? No. Look at that, my friends. How do you think God would view this in the church? How? It's an abomination to God. Look at that right there. And that's the husband. Handpecked. The woman is now leader. Just as Jezebel in the Bible is the one who led in the home of Ahab. That's 1 Kings. What's that? 1 Kings chapter 19. You said you want Bible, right? For, no, no, pardon me. 1 Kings 21. Yes, 1 Kings 21. And you can take a look at verse 8. Skip on down. Ahab, yeah, Jezebel, leading out with Ahab. Give me that verse in 1 Kings 21. 1 Kings 21. All right. It's right there. Small print right now. Yeah. Jezebel is the one that led out in the home. Look at that right there. Beloved. Startling. Elder, continue. And is the GC complicit in this woman's ordination? Now, what substantive action have they taken in any way, I'm, I'm open, in any way, to prevent this? By the way, remember too that not only the General Conference officers, but the North American Division officers are also GC officers. That's verse 25. You're still looking? I found it. Verse 25. 
but there was none like unto Ahab, which did sell himself to work wickedness in the sight of God, whom, watch now, whom Jezebel, his wife, stirred up. So who wore the proverbial pants in that home? Jezebel. When women, wives become pastors, elders, they are wearing the proverbial pants, modern day Jezebels. Yes, GC leaders, complicit. Look at that right there. What can the GC do? A picture says a thousand words. Look at that right there, my friends. Silence. Here's Mark Finley and Ted Wilson. We can simply voice our disapproval, but we can do nothing to stem the tide. Yes, the tsunami of apostasies. Yes, friends. The pandemic of apostasies. We're talking not about individuals, but entities. And I think that's an important distinction. If an entity consciously chooses to violate a voted church policy, and again, let's, let's define what a church policy is. A policy is a mutual agreement or a covenant that we make as the body of Christ of how we want to act. It is our best understanding of a topic at that given time. A policy is not doctrine. Doctrine, like the Sabbath, does not change. But policies can change. We can see different aspects of that policy. So let me come right to the heart of your question. You hold it right there, because I'm going to come to the heart of it right now. Policy, Sabbath is a doctrine. Well, God gave us a twin, two twin institutions, Sabbath and family, marriage, one man, one woman. Since Sabbath is not policy, seven-day Sabbath keeping is not policy, it's doctrine. So what is a one man, one woman, husband, wife, male, female? That's doctrine. All right? And as in the home, so in the church. So woman's ordination is not policy. Make sense? Ordaining a woman to become elder and pastor, it's breaking doctrine, Bible truth, not policy. Understand that. What if an entity chooses to violate a particular policy, whatever that policy is, consciously, because they feel conscientiously in not out of, out of harmony with that policy, okay? If they do that, they're on a slippery slope. <laughs> Although the General Conference does not have constituent authority because that union conference, etc., has constituent authority. Here is the slippery slope. It's Listen. precisely the question you've raised. Listen. How then do you deal with others who may say, my conscience is leading me in tithe or other areas? So I think the question you've what raised areas? from a young person's perspective is a question that we wrestle with in general conference leadership. What areas? Because we don't have constituent authority. Each individual group does. And I think our concern is this opens the door for other open violations of policy in the area of tithe, in the area of certain sexuality issues that people are going to say, look, this is a matter of conscience. See what happened there? In the matter of a variety of other things. So he... So so he connected women's ordination with promoting sodomy, LGBT in the church. Come in as you are, will baptize you as you are, and make you leaders as you are in sodomy. What can they do? Simply voice their disapproval. That sounds to me like modern day Eli. Look at this. It's the same Mark Finley. When the general conference was about to vote on women's ordination, simply said, accept the vote of the general conference body and move on with the mission. So that means if the general conference body had voted, ordained women as pastors, he would have accepted it, supported it because it's a policy. That's deception. That's what he said, not my words. May I ask you a question? Are there no longer conditions 
to make a person a member? Are we saying the no more requirements, biblical uh, uh, criteria and standards to ordain a person to become elder, deacon, pastor? They are throwing all biblical requirements out the window. Apostasy, apostasy. Here comes Eli. Yes, friends. All about policy. In Gospel Workers, page 150, it says, from top, so men today have argued until policy has taken the place of faithfulness. Mercy. What a statement. Policy has now taken the place of faithfulness. Sin is allowed to go unrebuked. But God raised up Nathan, 2 Samuel 12, verse 7, and he went to David and said, Thou art the man, an apostate. Stop crime, peace, and safety. In the book, Great Controversy, we are told. If unity, yes, could be secured only through the compromise of truth and righteousness, then let there be difference and even war. All right. Eli had greatly erred in permitting his sons to minister in holy office. Modern day Eli, he excused their course. Modern day Eli. But one day Eli said, I will remain silent no longer. Next paragraph, first sentence. Hophni and Phinehas, Eli's sons, they heard his mild admonitions, but they were not impressed, nor would they change their evil course, though warned of the consequences of their sins. Hmm. Do you see it now? So because, last sentence, but when Eli, the judge of Israel, neglected his work, God took the matter in his own hands. And what happened? Hophni and Phinehas were cut down. Eli was smitten by God, fell backwards, broke his head, broke his neck. That's it. And all Mark Finley, Ted Wilson can say, we can simply disapprove modern day Eli's. And many people would say, well, just blame the conference, blame the union. We are the general conference leaders. May I ask you a question? Who sends, who approves Ganundiop to be smiling? Yes, and courting the Pope of Rome, the Jesuit Pope. And Ganundiop is now saying, it's okay for SDAs to be ecumenical. The three angels' messages are ecumenical in nature. We must unite with the men from Babylon. And the man is still in his position. Ted Wilson, at the last general conference session, said, listen, bring all these leaders together and everybody must vote up or down, approve or disapprove, not individually on the officers, but approve or disapprove on all of them together. Why would you do that? Because you have a sinister, demonic agenda. Thou art the man, an apostate. And when he was elected, oh, he's modern day Josiah. Modern day what? Let me tell you what Josiah did. In 2 Kings chapter 23, let's see Josiah. In 2 Kings 23, the Bible speaks of in verse 5, the leaders of Israel, of Judah, brought in the prophets of Baal. Baal is sun worship, nature worship, Sunday worship. And verse 7 of 2 Kings 23, they brought in Sodomites in the church. 2 Kings 23 verse 7, they brought in Sodomites. Did Josiah simply disapprove? Or did he go to work? These men are not Josiah's. They are Satan's emissaries. And if they don't repent, they will suffer the wrath and vengeance of God. How do you think God feels when people in these pews are being deceived? Whoa, whoa, whoa. All right. 
There it is, friends. There it is. It says, he incurred the Lord's displeasure by not reproving sin and executing justice upon the sinner. Listen, those who have too long, those who have too little courage, pardon me, those who have too little courage to reprove wrong or who through indolence or lack of interest make no, er make no earnest effort, slow it down, no earnest effort to purify the family of God, to purify the church of God are held accountable for the evil that may result from their neglect of duty. That's not on some manuscript in some, in some vault on the ground hidden with dust. That is from the book, Petros and Prophets, page 578, the account of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas. So God does not want to hear from SDA leaders, oh, we simply disapprove. Get back here, preacher, what it says there. They must make earnest effort to purify the family of God, the church of God. If not, they are going to be held accountable for the evil. That's not my words. That's the word of God. We have in the chat, School of the Prophets, 1844 writes, probation is soon closing. We must sigh and cry, not joining in this abomination. And he quotes Deuteronomy 22, verse 5. Thank you for your comment. Hillary writes, the whole head is sick. I agree. That's Isaiah chapter 1. Dynamiter writes, the shaking is about to take place. Let me augment that. It's the final shaking that's about to be completed. We're already in the shaking time. Back to Elder Larry. Continue. Is the church just becoming a secular priesthood, an echo chamber for the narratives of secular ideologies? Uh, are, do we need really to copy all the other things that come down to us? Uh, why don't we copy from God's word the truths that are there? Why are we copying the work of God's enemy? Yeah, we have become just like the world. And that's why we're told in Testimonies to Ministers, page 372, Whole conferences are going to be turned and overturned. Whole conferences are going to be lost. And yet they'll tell you the writings of Sister White were and are not inspired. And all of this began when they voted at the general conference session. Sister White's writings can simply enrich but not define or of faith and practice. Yes, and we're told in Selected Messages, Book 1, page 48, once they demote the spirit of prophecy, we are told a flood of apostasies will take over the church. Look at that right there. Do you realize, in, I believe, the very same Sabbath, once Joanne Cortez was ordained, they had elders' ordination, do you realize she's now laying hands on a male elder and a woman to now become an elder? She's laying on hands on individuals. Where in the Bible do you find Christ ordaining a woman and then she is now ordaining others? The Bible says, Paul, the apostles, they ordained elders, men, and they went to the cities in the book of Acts, raising of churches, baptizing people. Where in the Bible do you find a woman baptizing others sanctioned by God? It's not in the Bible. It came from Babylon. It's right there, friends. If the first picture was not clear. And look where the husband hand is. Look at that. Who is praying? They have reversed God's order. It's time to cry aloud. Spear not. Lift up the voice like a trumpet. No flute. No fiddle. And show God's people their transgressions, iniquities, sins, apostasy.
apostasies. Isaiah 58 verse 1. Look at that right there. In the same meeting, where do you find that? In God's church, in the Bible. It's apostasy. And look at the husband looking on. What a sight for sore eyes, as they would say proverbially. Look at that right there, friends. Huh? Let me tell you something. If God does not come and close probation shortly, Romans chapter, what? Romans chapter 9 says the whole church will become like Sodom and Gomorrah. Romans chapter 9, verse 27 through verse 29. If God does not cut the work short, the whole church will become as Sodom and Gomorrah. And the, look at the screen. And these young people who are coming in, they become youth leaders. Apostasies will become prevalent. They become leaders in the church. Apostasy, apostasy, apostasies. It was necessary that this sin should be punished as a testimony to surrounding nations of God's displeasure against idolatry. There must be left on record a solemn and public protest against their crime. Yes, they built a golden calf at the base of Mount Sinai. Yes. I'm not even addressing the person in the so-called baptismal pool. It's the apostate leaders I'm addressing here. Modern day, Aaron, apostates. Yes, red lipstick, sure, writes in the chat. Red lipstick, the standards out the door. The people, the majority don't know any better. Yes. And yet people would say, we don't want Moses, give us Aaron. But who loved the people more? Not Aaron, Moses. A solemn protest. And then he went up to pray and say, Lord, blot me out. Save your people. He was willing to die for the people. What a leader like Moses. But the people love Aaron more. Blessed one, right, Lucifer tried to bring sin into heaven. In the Garden of Eden, he was cast out. History is being repeated. I concur. The close of probation is near. Look at that right there, friends. All right. And that's why there needs to be a solemn protest. My friends, they did not put this on their phones secretly. It's being publicized on YouTube, on social media, Facebook, on Instagram. What's going to happen when the world sees this? Would they want to join the SDA local churches? There must be something on record, a solemn protest. Back to the elder. Continue, preacher. If the General Conference, which effectively has been granted policing responsibility on behalf of the global membership, if they refuse to hold the line, who will? If a nation refuses to police its own borders, that nation will cease to exist as a distinct people. The same is true for God's church. If we countenance the ordination of just any person to the gospel ministry, how will God bless us with depth of Bible commitment as a people? What a statement he made right there. And friends, as he made that statement, which I saw yesterday, this morning rather, as a result I'm presenting this, I found this so-called image based on what's trending at the U.S. southern border. Heaven has strict immigration laws. Hell has open borders. What a fitting. You know what? Maybe that must be placed on some SDA churches. Open borders. Come on in. Just as you are. Violate God. Violate the laws of the land. And violate the laws of God. Look at this right here, friends. Hophni and Phineas. Unfaithful. And what were Hophni and Phineas bringing into the church? Immorality, 
Write down these scriptures. 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 12, verse 22. They were sons of Belial, they were called. And the sons of Belial were connected with homosexuality. That's Judges chapter 19, verse 16 through verse 22. And my friends, the Bible tells us that people stop going to church if you really want to get their attention. Remember, the love of money is the root of all evil. As long as you keep giving them God's money, they will continue in their apostasy. Put that money where God's work is being promoted. Do not support apostasies, especially when you can see it. You can hear it. Don't do it. You will be held accountable. You are amenable to God to how you use his gifts. If you did not know, if you're ignorant, like the widow with our little pennies, her might, God will bless. But if you know and still support apostasy, you'll be held accountable. Judgment for you. All right? That's 1 Samuel chapter 2 and verse 17. They stopped going to church. The statement is right here, friends. Very, very clear. It says, blue words, many of the people in the days of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, they ceased going to the place of worship. And that's why God has to raise up churches not connected to the conference organization of Seventh-day Adventist. He has to for the work to be finished completely and for people to find a place where truth is. Because the majority of them are in apostasy. And many of those who are receiving a paycheck will go this far and no further in the protest. Listen to them carefully. They'll go this far and no further. They have to secure their retirement check. We are told, take our young men and young women and place them where they will come as little as possible in contact with our churches. Why? In those churches, the leaders are in apostasy. Move on. The Lord does not now work to bring many souls into the truth because of church members who, are, who have never been converted and those who were once converted have now backslidden. God is not bringing people into those churches. He's not doing it. Probation is about to close. If somebody has fainted, yes, unconscious, we bring a defibrillator. Why? We want to shock the heart. Shock the body. Wake up. There must be a forceful message to awaken a stupefied church. Too much dilly-dallying. Playing church. Pacifying apostates. Tyrants. Watch this. It would be poor policy to support from the treasury of God, tithe and offering, those who really mar and injure his work and who are constantly lowering the standard of Christianity. Do not bring your monies there. That's 1 Samuel 2, verse 17. I gave you a prior statement and a second statement. There are fearful woes for those who preach the truth but are not sanctified by it. And also a fearful woe for those who consent to receive, consent to maintain the unsanctified, to minister to them, to preach to them, word and doctrine, a fearful woe if you sit in those churches. It's clear for those who want to see it. A fearful woe if you sit in those churches. 
Oh, but we must stay here. The ship, that ship is going to sink. Plant your feet on the rock of ages. Continue, Elder. We don't play games around here. Enough is enough. But I ask in earnest, when will this lethargy, this inaction, cease and godly action be taken by those in responsible positions? How long... Stop it, right. Hold on, hold on. Someone is spamming the chat. Raheem. Oh, the church may appear as about to fall. It will not fall, it remains. Maybe you're ignorant of that statement. Go search for the context of that statement. It's talking about when the Sunday law is enforced. That statement does not apply before the mark of the beast. When the Sunday law is enforced. You keep on looking for hooks to hang your doubts upon. You'll perish with the apostates. Continue. By the way, there is a video on this platform, about 45 minutes, where I covered that and other statements. We don't play games around here. But I ask in earnest, when will this lethargy, this inaction cease? and godly action be taken by those in responsible positions. How long, O oh Lord? How long, O oh Lord? How long? He's pleading. How long? He's pleading. How long? I can feel his pathos. How long, O oh Lord? This ungodly inaction, how long? Friends, Gideon, Gideon must declare war upon idolatry in the church before going to battle with the enemies of God's people. We should not talk about just apostasies, the mark of the beast, son the law coming in the world. Declare war first upon the idolatry, the apostasy in the church. Gideon, where are they today, friends? And we're told the father of Gideon erected sun worship and with sun worship, Baal, Baal worship, with Baal worship, we have sodomy, that second Kings 23, verse 5, Baal worship, and verse 7, sodomy, that's a nail in a sure place. Before we declare war without, declare war within. Baal within, sodomy within. Where are the modern day Gideons? God gave us two institutions. Let's get the poll ready. The Sabbath and marriage. When we see the church violating God's order of marriage, the next step is to teach people to desecrate God's seventh day Sabbath. Here is your poll question. And the purpose of the poll question is to emphasize this point. Question, which woman in the Bible wanted to be ordained as an elder in God's church yet received God's wrath? You have four options. Option A, Athaliah. Option B, Jezebel. Option C, Miriam. Option D, Martha. Once the preacher give me the thumbs up. Thumbs up, it's posted. Yeah, which woman in the Bible desired to be ordained as an elder in God's church yet receive God's wrath? This is in a question format. I want this point to stand out very clearly. While you're answering, let me move on here. Many reformers in entering upon their work determined that they must exercise great prudence in attacking the sins of the church and the nation. Oh, Pastor Enriquez, please be careful. Don't preach against the SDA church. Next sentence. They hoped by the example of a pure Christian life to lead the people back to the doctrines of the Bible. But... When the Spirit of God 
came upon them as it came upon Elijah, moving him to rebuke the sins of a wicked king and an apostate people. They could not refrain. That's it, friends. We must preach. We must protest. That's why we are here. We must protest and the poll. Let's see the response here. What is the result? Athaliah, Jezebel, Miriam, Martha. So we have 52% chose Miriam. Option C, that is correct. God said to Moses, bring 70 elders. That same spirit are used to anoint the 70 elders. And Miriam wanted to be one of the 70 elders. And because she was rejected, she began to be racist, prejudiced against the poor. It's right there, friends. Against the poorer. Page 384. It's right there on the screen. And because she was not brought in to the council with, 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 with Moses, oh, she felt slighted. I want to be an elder. I want to be ordained. And God smote her with plagues. Mercy. And Aaron sympathized with her. So today, who are modern day Miriam? Hmm. Joanne Cortez and others. Who is modern day Aaron? You see my point? The GC leaders, the Columbia Union leaders, Charles Tapp, Potama Conference leaders, and the rest. Yes, all over the world of SDA, modern day apostate Aaron's. Notice, she received the plagues. All right. And what will God pour out when the mark of the beast is enforced? The seven last plagues. So, what will be a sign in the church? The seven last plagues will be poured out when we see women's ordination and sodomy being exhorted in the SDA church. I've been preaching this since 2012. The record is here on this platform, on our channel. And I've never ceased to protest since. Yes. So while we say church and state union, labor unions, yes. Um, um, Speaker Johnson and, and Trump and Biden, signs. The... Jesuits, thank you preachers, the Pope of Rome, what about the signs in the church? The plagues are about to be poured out. Hillary writes in the chat, the present showing is sufficient to prove to all who have the true missionary spirit that the regular lines, that's a conference organized body of SDA, the regular lines, may prove a failure and a sneer, end quote. That is GCB, April 11th, 1903, paragraph six. Prove a failure and a sneer. And we're told the protest of Moses. Moses protested, took action and prayed. Elijah protested, took action and prayed. Josiah protested, took action and prayed. It goes hand in hand. Thank you, Hillary. You must be the wife of one Andrew Henriquez. In the Bible, Mark 3, 14, Christ called 12 males, men, XX chromosomes. Amen, brother. Ordained 12 men. That's it right there. Is that point clear? Oh, oh, mm, mm. I missed one other scripture. And friends, the first person at the resurrection tomb of Christ was Mary Magdalene. Think about that. And yet Mary was not cho chosen to be ordained. When Judas fell through transgression, there were only 11 men. Why would Christ not say, well, come on, Mary Magdalene, make up the number 12. Oh, no. 
Acts chapter 1. That's my second scripture. I missed it. Acts chapter 1. Christ said, choose of these two men, Justus or Matthias. And Matthias was chosen and became number 12. Men, males, X, X chromosomes were chosen to be ordained, to be elders, to raise up churches, to baptize, communion service, yes, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, yes, to ordain others, communion service, yes, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table, yes, to ordain others, men, that's the biblical order. I close. In this fearful time, just before Christ is to come the second time, God's faithful preachers will have to bear a still more pointed testimony than was born by John the Baptist. A responsible, important work is before them. And those who speak smooth things, God would not acknowledge as his shepherds the last six words. A fearful woe is upon them. Safe to Serve International. You will hear from people who will begin to deflect from this issue and say, look, oh, he's calling people out of the church. They'll begin to raise straw men to dilute this message. Don't give them any attention. You know. Oh, he's calling God's church Babylon. Oh, pardon me. XY chromosomes. Thank you. XY chromosomes. XY. Why? Yes, why? How could you forget? Why? Woman XX. Thank you so much. Amen. Back to my point. Don't let them deflect and distort what was heard today. We are living in the hour of crisis. And that's why God needs to have lighthouses erected. And this is one of several issues. There's so much apostasy going on. But we want to excuse it and leave the tyrants in office to lead out. God forbid. In Matthew chapter 15, Christ says, any man, any leadership that teach for doctrines, the commandments of men, leave them alone. Matthew 15, verse 6 through verse 13. The disciples went to Christ. Oh, Christ, please unite with the leaders of the church, the conference of that day. Christ says, these are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, if the blind follow the blind, both will fall in the ditch. And in the book, The Desire of Ages, we are told, Christ said he will not turn over the sheep in the hands of enemies of the faith. Enemies of the faith. And we saw what two men had to do. Nicodemus and Joseph had to do. At some point, they had to pack their bags and join the faithful movement of God. If this video was a blessing to you, this lesson was a blessing to you, give it a thumbs up. Whatever points stood out to you, post that below. I'll meet you later on. By God's grace, if you have not yet subscribed, you know what to do and hit that bell. Share the video so we can awaken others. We're streaming on other platforms. The links are in the description. The Lord is soon to come. The signs are ominous. And remember, the protest continues. Maranatha.